Welcome back. After taking a short break, I'm really happy to be back here sharing episode 18 with you. This is going to be part one of two episodes with Tamir Moskovich. Many of you know him as the man responsible for Urban Outlaw, but also Kaz, Ayrton's Wish, Painting Coconuts, and many, many other great pieces of auto and non-auto film. Tamir has been an inspiring part of what's kept me doing what I do here at The Bucket Seat and wanting to really meet more people like him. It's his unique ability to combine the very mechanical appeal of cars and motoring with the very relatable and human side of their owners and builders. And that's what makes his style of storytelling so interesting to me. We talk about it in both episodes, but finding that balance is certainly a skill that stands out when you see his work. In part one, Tamir shares with me the history behind his passion for cars, what he's driving these days, and how he established his relationship with Magnus Walker. In part two, we go deeper on Urban Outlaw, Kaz, and the making of his films, so stay tuned for that episode, which will be coming out soon. And now, into episode 18. This is the Bucket Seat Podcast. Why don't we just, for the sake of, uh, it's kind of the starting point of all of this, why don't we just start with gotcha. Urban Outlaw and then I'll give you the background history and all the rest of it. Yeah, so, so I, before you even before you even get yeah. into it, what I'm going to do is, um, is I'm just going to say a quick little, uh, a quick little piece and so... Um, so this is episode 18 of the Bucket Seat Podcast, and um, I'm your host, Trevor Byrne. This evening, I have the pleasure of introducing Tamir Moscovici. And I'm, am I pronouncing that correctly? It's Moscovich or Moscovici, whatever you want. Like, okay. It kind of goes <laughs> okay. both ways, depending on where you are. But Moscovich is the traditional... The, the correct way. Yeah. Right. Um, and so for our listeners, um, what's... You know, I've been really excited about having you on the show, and um, I've uh, I've kind of followed what you've done for I mean for for quite a while now too. And I think you know we're both in a well, I, I'm in an industry that you know typically has to uh, kind of reach out to talented gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen like yourself. And um, so I've kind of kept tabs on what you've been up to, and it's been really fascinating for me uh, because you're you are a director. You're a filmmaker. Um, you're based here out of Toronto, which I think is equally as interesting for me. Um, and so for those listening, you know, Urban Outlaw, uh, Desert Outlaw, Kaz, you've got Ayrton's Wish, um, what else do I have now? Oh, right, Painting Coconuts, um, and then a ton of other Porsche commercials, and that's just on the car side alone, so and some other short films I know in there as well, um, but you're also a car lover, and, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the kickers, and I think that's why I was so interested in having you as a guest, is that... I think you have a, so I know you have a 914 and that's a recent addition to the family. Yeah. Um, but do you also have a 993? I did till I put it in the wall at uh, 150 kilometers an hour in the bottom of turn two. Oh, no shit. At Mossport. But now <laughs> I have, but then I replaced it with a 911. It's a 1974 911 that's been RS'd out and twin plugged with the F, like it's a monster. Amazing. Wow. So that's the baby. And then the 914 was kind of a happy kind of connection to a childhood dream yeah now i just need to get the 2002 bmw mm, to park mm. next to it and then it'll be complete of and course. then the vw right camper van and then the defender and then it goes on and on but right 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 i mean an icon defender <laughs> if i could but yeah, we'll see so you say that the um so that your your love for 911s uh, it's like a childhood dream. So what was it that spurred that? What kind of got you into cars in the first place? So that's what I find a lot of the times most interesting, but most people come on the show is what got you into it? What got you that, that passion brewing? Well, you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, it's one of those weird things because I never saw myself or thought of myself as the guy who was into cars. It was just kind of around me. My dad was an aerospace engineer. And so I had blueprints of Hitachi helicopters and F-16s and he was in the... Israeli military and then he was at de Havilland and Bombardier and 
DC, like doing all these things, like he did the wings for the Dash 8. And so planes and right. automotive were around. And then he was involved with building the Windstar plant in Windsor and creating the layout of the mechanics of the robots and all that stuff. So this shit was just around me. Yeah. But we were never the kind of family that was lift the hood of the car and rebuild it. So I was taking bicycles apart and lawnmowers and doing my own thing and building my own skateboards and what <laughs> have you as a kid. And there was a mechanical inclination, but it was never really fed from that standpoint. But I remember vividly having the deconstructed poster of the 959 on the wall. <laughs> nice. And, yeah. you know, when I had a paper route as a kid, I would go past this house and there was a, you know, red... 2002 BMW and the chick who owned it, it was, her dad had got her the car. It was her first car. She must have been 18 or 19 and she was a babysitter and I was 10 and it was her hair was red, the car was red. And right. I was in love. Like that was it, right? Like this, that was an imprint. And then around the corner, there was another car and it was this, it said Porsche on it. And I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and it was yeah. a 914 and uh -huh. it was red and black and totally Miami Sammy pimped out. And it was just like, what is this thing? Yeah. And so there was an attraction to that, even being on road trips as a kid going down to Florida in the station wagon and my playroom was the back of the station wagon. I had that little <laughs> analog video game where you were racing up the road, right? And right. so like that stuff was just part of it. And I, it didn't sit with me as like, you're a car guy because mm -hmm. I didn't have an older brother or younger brother that I was building cars with. It was just, I liked cars. My car, first car, I was 16, was a 1979 Malibu Classic V8 with more rust in it than car. No. But I loved that thing. I had to have a <laughs> external stereo because the radio didn't work. Right. And if you drove with the windows down in the winter, you'd get carbon monoxide <laughs> in from the exhaust pipes. So you're driving with the winters op windows open in the winter. Yeah. And that was just part of it. It was like the wings of freedom and that's what the car represented. And so it was always an emotional connection to it. Right. And then... As time went on and I got older, I decided, oh, you know what? I'm done driving shitty cars. And I tried to count all the shitty cars from the Pontiac Sunfire to the shitty Jetta to the shitty Corolla to the shitty Camry. And I was like, <laughs> that's it. I'm done. And I found for like 1500 bucks a 1969 BMW Ti Lux with Euro headlights, mm -hmm. one cylinder was shot. And I was like, I'm going to rebuild this car. Nice. This was it. Uh -huh. And I thought, I'll do it with my dad and we'll bond over it and this is going to happen. And never, he, we tried to do the carbs and he was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Forget <laughs> it. And I managed, I started shopping around going, okay, well, do I find a mechanic and do something with this? And the mechanic I went to, who was this gentleman by the name of Harry's, who had a shop that's uh, Harry's Classic Car, which is now owned by my buddy Chris at s, &S Motors at Broadway Broadview and Queen over were just over the bridge. Yeah. Harry was like, I've got this 91 318. You don't want the 2002. You don't want this. And I was like, all right. And it was three grand and I bought it. And that was it. I was done. It was, I was hooked on the Euro car, ended up getting a 328. Mm -hmm. And the path kind of continued. But I didn't get reconnected with Porsche as a brand or the 911. For much later, I was deep down the BMW kind of path and I was loving it. And I was like, yeah, I'm still going to get a 2002. And then we had kids and my wife was like, I'm tired of the 928 breaking down. <laughs> it's you, inevitable. It's yeah. inevitable. Yeah. Like this thing is a monster. I don't like it. I was like, we've well, got the 318. She's like, we need something for the family. So I got the, the touring wagon. It was like, it was just like staying in that BMW mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And then... Out of for, you know, out of just sheer coincidence, we had a dog. The dog was getting old, was getting ill, and I could no longer do these big, long, six-kilometer walks around High Park anymore. So I started doing these little walks through the Junction neighborhood where I lived, and I passed by this guy Len's house, who always had these crazy cars from 928s to 911s to like the international 1930 pickup trucks and El Caminos. There was always these cars and all of a sudden there was this uh, black Targa, black on black on black Targa in his driveway. And I just looked at it and I was like, that's a really sexy little car. Mm -hmm. And it just caught my eye. And I'd never done this before, but I started kind 
kind of circulating around it. <laughs> and it was almost like a homing beacon. I just kept coming back by Len's place for like a week. All of a sudden I was driving by with my family and I turned to my wife and be like, check out that little Porsche. And she was like, I thought you were a BMW guy. I'm like, shh, no, yeah, honey. Yeah. Look at it. Just right? planting the seed. Just planting the seed. Right. And she was like, ah, oh, whatever. You're nuts. And so we carried on. And then one day I just put a note in the window. And I was like, nice. Hey, you did. I, I, I think actually dreams of doing that. I yeah. actually did. And I put a note in the window. I said, hey, if you're ever thinking of selling it, because I had no idea. Sure. So he calls me back. He's like, yeah, I flip cars all the time. I got this Targa. You know, a car is only worth what you pay for it. What do you what do you want to pay for it? And instantly, as if like the the cosmos wanted me to have this car, I get a phone call from my production company and they're like, Hey, we got this really terrible project. And <laughs> it's really it's just shooting like throws to commercial for a TV show on green screen, but they need a commercial director that's got this background that knows the VFX and studio. And I'm like, what's it pay? <laughs> and it just happened to be the same price as the car. And they're like, uh, that's incredible. But, but, but why are you doing this? And I'm yeah. like, no, 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 it'll be great. I'm working with TV talent. It'll be wonderful. <laughs> Let's do this thing. And they're like, okay. And because of the delay of when the shoot was versus me going, all right, the gig's in and it booked, I actually got to drive the Targa to set. Oh, man. So it was like this super satisfying, like, oh, amazing. And so it was a 1985 black on black Targa. And that sent me down the rabbit hole of going, okay, I know nothing about these cars. Mm -hmm. I don't even mm -hmm. know what mechanic serviced it. I was still going to my buddy Chris at his shop, and he was well-versed in European cars. And so he's like, oh, you need this, you need that. We were chasing leaks in the roof. And it was like, mm -hmm. I'm going to get this thing sorted and about... Three and a half months in, after joining the Porsche Club and doing a, you know, DSI, which was like your introductory track day event, and going, okay, this is it. I bought this car. I'm going to the track. I'm coming up Spadina, and there's rush hour traffic, and this young woman just cut three lanes of traffic, popped out up from behind a streetcar as I had the right of way to go and no. T-bone me, and it was fully out of Californication. I had now completely crushed the front quarter panel driver's side the frame was slightly twisted her car was done but i could still drive and as i'm pulling through downtown toronto to get out to go to the damage report place yeah i kid you not 20 japanese tourists get off a boat stop me and are fucking <laughs> taking photos of me and telling me to stop and i'm missing getting through the light and yeah. my blood pressure is boiling and i'm like of stop taking pictures of my car <laughs> and then i'm driving kids are pointing at it at a school buses and i'm like oh my god get there the cops are like we have no idea how to rate this and i'm like 30 grand to start right and then i go to a mechanic who then later becomes a good friend and buddy and helped me build my cars as it passed down the line he was like this is a total loss and the insurance company comes back and goes hey, we're gonna give you a check for five thousand dollars more than you paid for the car wow. basically because it appreciated in that three month window yeah yeah and i was like this is amazing and so <laughs> welcome to porsche <laughs> yeah so that was my my foray into porsche and i was like okay this is great but now i'm without a porsche and in a porsche it's in the blood and out of the blue, this guy shows up in my life who happened to be a high school buddy of my wife's. And he was working at um, an exotic car shop. And he basically said to me, look, these two doctors came in, young doctors in love with more money than they know what to do. One of them wants a, tar wants a convertible and the other one wants a GT3. And they have this 993 and you should really get into a 993. And I was like, what's the price? And he's like, I'll sell it to you for the profit I need to make. If I take the car, I lose the profit. I, my boss just doesn't want me to sit on the car. Mm -hmm. So I managed to get this car for 16 grand. Oh my God. <laughs> which was like the steal of the century. So yeah. then yeah. I went deep down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Brent at Hunter Motorsports helped me. We redid the suspension, the put turbo tie rods on, all the rest. And we just did it up. I pulled out the seats, put a harness uh, roll bar and was like, this was the track car. Uh huh. And... You know, as you do at the track, you win, you lose, and you crash. And so I've lost <laughs> yeah. and I've crashed. Yeah, and there's, the, there's no real insurance to cover that. <laughs> well, here's the thing that technically by law, under Ontario law, 
if it's not a racing event, if it's a driver's education event with no start, finish, and no timed event that's very specific, doesn't mean you and I can't chase each other. Interesting. I had no clue about right. this. By law, that's a driver's educational event. And so I was coached after hitting the wall at the bottom of turn two, as many have. Allegedly. <laughs> no, no, I hit the wall. But I was coached to say I was driving at a driver's educational event. Sure. At yeah. speed. Mm -hmm. Don't know what the speed was because I was focused on what of was course, around yeah. me. you focused on your line. Right. And the lo car lost control and went into a barrier wall. Right. Not the track wall. Right, right. So the insurance company turned around and gave me a check for 40 grand. It was like, oh my gosh, we don't want to hear from you. And I was like, <laughs> hey, Brent, what do I do? And yeah. he's like, I think you should buy this 74 911. Oh. It's clean. It's sunroof delete. It's already been SC flared in the back. Oh my God. Let's make this the hot rod we want to make. So he convinced me to do it. And I just went deep down the rabbit hole. And so yeah. this car was a year and a half project where we basically, from start to finish, because it was already flared out, we could get uh, 245s on the back and 205s, which I can actually, because it's been roll put, 225. So that'll be the next step. But it's got 245s on the back, 205s on the front, mm -hmm. 2002 Boxster brakes. So it's been updated. Mm -hmm. Uh, an elephant racing suspension kit all the way through. We then put a WeaveTech limited slip differential in, Wevo gate shifter and a Wevo gate in it, so it's fully dialed in. And then he rebuilt the motor, and Brent's a master motor builder. So basically, it's a he had original Porsche RS heads from the back in the racing days. They sold me 50 cents on the dollar. We put turbo rods in, rebuilt the crank, the case. Uh, 964 uh, crankshafts and like oh, shit. basically it's got a 10.5 to 1 compression it's twin plugged EFI and it produces 265 to the crank 210 to the rear wheels and it weighs 2100 pounds we took all the impact bumpers off and put RS bumpers on nice. so that nice so roof bumpers on so it's lightweight oh nice yeah wow and then Inside, we did RS carpets, RS door panels. I put GTS seats in that are the Nurburgring seats that are all just like tube frame <laughs> canvas, so it's ultra lightweight. <laughs> the roll bar that saved my life going in on the 993 is the same matter roll bar that's in there that's a factory fit from Porsche. And this is my dream car, right? It's oh like the car. If you ever ask me what car do I want, yeah, this is it. One, I'm right? done. I oh, put my man. blood, sweat, and tears into it. And so then... It fell under classic car insurance, and now it's like taking that to the track means if I want to recoup, I got to get track insurance. So things got a little more expensive, okay. yeah. which is where my interest started to go. Well, because these things don't cost 15 grand anymore, they used to be Honda Civics, right? Like yeah. You just buy yeah. one. And Nobody wanted them. Yeah. You know, you'd drive the hell out of them, and that was the whole point of them. Yeah. So I kind of went, well, I'm deep down the Porsche world. I've had three 911s. I understand them. I've got the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So that's where the 914 came in. And so I started pursuing the 914 and going, okay, it's mid-engine car. It's perfectly balanced. Predecessors yeah. and Boxster. It's going to go up in value. Absolutely. So if I can get it in on the ground floor, get it now, leave it a four-stroke. Like, mm -hmm. don't turn it Is into it a two six. Liter? Mine's a two-liter. Right. But, but they can't. The it, like, it was oh. a 1.7, 1 1.8, 1 right. and 2 liter. 2 liter only, being the last of all the variants, right? Right. Yeah. But I only found out it was a 2 liter when we pulled the motor. It We thought it was a 1.8. Oh, no shit. But it doesn't matter because what we're going to do to it <laughs> yeah. is a whole other thing. So right. I got lucky with this car. It was gifted, and that's a different story. Mm hmm. But what I, I, I do have to admit, I was listening to um, the Smoking Tire podcast right. when they had uh, when they had Magnus yeah. Walker on the show. and. He took, you know, I think when I reached out to you, I'd said about 10 minutes to specifically uh, explain how much he both had owed you and then also the, the whole idea of the 914 and how that kind of came about between the two of you. So as soon as he'd said that, I went, I got to ask him about that 914. So Yeah, so basically what happened, and we can go into the detail and you can edit and do whatever you want. No, nah, you know this is like, this is like a, a start to finish. I don't edit anything yet. Okay. just go for so, it. So we'll talk about Urban Outlaw and how that happened. Yeah. but. Essentially what happened is Magnus and I have become very close friends since Urban Outlaw. And we've had some pretty crazy parallel experiences in our lives. 
And when I was in LA last year in September, before his wife passed away and a year before my wife passed away. Right. I'm very sorry to hear that too. And I, I know that I, I kind of had heard that timing and I just went, wow, what a crazy world. I mean, it, yeah, it really is. And I mean, it, the weird thing about Magnus and I is that we literally befriended doing this film. Right. And it wasn't like a childhood friend. We befriended during this experiential process and that friendship has been a bond that's like, you know, it's rare at our age. I mean, he's almost 50. Mm -hmm. I'm 43 to meet someone later in life where you have that kind of bond and connection. So mm -hmm. then to have these parallel existence happen that, you know, we both lose our wives, you know, all that kind of stuff. It was kind of crazy. Right. Yeah. But it just tightened the relationship and the friendship. And so what happened was I was in L.A. shooting a pilot for History Channel with Magnus for a TV show. And... Originally, it was a concept that I had originally written based off Urban Outline. It was this mashup between, what if you take the Anthony Bourdain kind of punk rock mentality of you can't change this tiger stripes. He's going to play it as it is. Yeah. But instead of doing food, you do car culture. Oh, my God. I love this. <laughs> yeah. And so that was the pitch. And then basically through the process, Spike Ferguson and his partner, John, who had done a bunch of shows and so on, they had basically sold the concept to history, but they just kind of sold it as like, hey, we got a show with Magnus Walker. And when Magnus said, well, yeah, this is the show, they all went, yeah, that's great. And so we were under the assumption that they were doing that show, but they were kind of doing it like, let's do a watered down version of that show mm. so that it's lowest common denominator for history. And right. that wasn't really discussed going in. So there was a bit of tension, but at the same time, you know, we did our best. History got behind the show. They put it out there, but Magnus and myself kind of went, you know what? This is a one-off. We're not going to go down this path anymore. Mm -hmm. Let's just stop where we're at because we're not all seeing eye to eye. But that's not to, to shit on the show, but it was more just kind of sometimes it's best to have some creative integrity and go, you guys have your vision. We have ours. This isn't going to gel. Let's mm -hmm. all part ways. Right. But during that process, while I was in LA, and I have a production company. Sorry, this was this was pre-shoot for for the hist for the guys. In this history? was pre-history. No, this was like during the shooting period okay. for history. But while I was down there, yeah, I was just shopping for nine fourteens. I was like, you know what? <laughs> it's not a lot of money. This pilot for a show, we uh -huh. don't know where it goes, but it is the price of a nine fourteen. Sure, yeah. And I was like, that'd be a nice kind of like, hey, I did a show and I bought a nine fourteen. I yeah, leave yeah. it in LA, and I wasn't really thinking much of it. And kind of, I started shopping around. There was a car in Texas. There was a car here. I was looking at them. And Magnus was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I just picked up this red one. I traded some wheels for it. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then we're shooting. We're doing stuff. And he's like, oh, I picked up this yellow one. I'm like, dude, <laughs> like, well, I'm trying to buy one of these cars. He's like, yeah, yeah, Well, these were in the works. I'm like, okay, <laughs> whatever. You know, really like the yellow one. Yeah. Cool. And never really thought of it. And then just in passing, I was like, hey, if you ever want to sell the yellow one, I'll buy it. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just kind of moved on. <laughs> and I was getting the call from my wife that things had gotten worse in her situation and okay. Karen was getting a bit worse. And mm -hmm. I had to, we finished shooting and I had to fly to the Canary Islands to go do a Porsche Boxster, the nine, the 718 launch for the Boxster spot. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. And so I kind of dropped the whole 914 pursuit okay and i was like oh, i gotta deal with life right yeah <laughs> and it was a fantasy and i took uh -huh. off yeah and then you know the show went out people liked it history got behind it and then it kind of just fizzled away and then karen passed away and it, life kind of pursuits changed right and then as six seven months passed i was like hey man you know I'm kind of looking for a project because stuff at home's rough and maybe I'm going to get myself back into that 914 project. Are you ever going to sell me that yellow car? He's like, yeah, I told you, it's yours. And I'm like, no, what's the price? And he's like, yeah, yeah it's yours. Just, oh you know, God. keys to happiness. And I'm like, dude, you're <laughs> fucking with me. Yeah. Is it five grand? Is it three grand? Is it right. seven grand? Like, yeah. what's the price? Tell me. Yeah. You know, like, I know I'm going to have to do work. And he's like, no, 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 you don't seem to understand. The car's yours. Oh. I owe you for everything you've done. This is my way of saying thank you. And I'm like, you fucking bonkers. Like, nobody gives away a car. He's like, dude, don't worry about it. And I'm like, 
okay, fine. This is great. I accept. You know what? I'm in. Like, if, if, if you're actually saying this, yeah, thinking, you, can't, you can't turn that down. I'm not going to turn it down, but I'm kept in the back of my mind thinking, no, I'm going to buy the car for me. Like, right. you know, like it's even a thousand bucks, like, sure. right? Yeah. And then I start to find the legacy of the car. So the history of this car, like though my 911 is like this little pearl and like it's this gem. Right. You start to follow the history of the car. The guys at Sharkworks bought the car. Oh, come on. To turn it into a hot rod. It got shelved and they just got too busy and it sat in their lot for two years. Magnus got it from them. Wow. And then all of a sudden it was the Magnus Walker 914 that he did nothing to it. Right. And then he gave it to me. And so the, now it's like, oh, the guy did Urban Outlaw. Okay, so that's the trajectory. Then the guys at Carbone in Poland who do all these like graphic design stuff, I contact them and we're like, hey, this is what I want to do. Can you do me a mock-up? They do a mock-up. I'm like, great. Then I call Matt, Magnus's painter at Alchemy. And I'm like, dude, can you do this? And he's like, holy mm-hmm. fuck, this is awesome. Magnus <laughs> is like, hey, what do you think about adding this to it? I'm like, sounds great. And then all of a sudden... Fifteen hundred dollars later, we've painted this car into this like crazy little rad black and yellow yeah. monster. And he's like, "I'm going to do the same to the red one." I'm like, "Sounds great." Oh, it and looks then, so good. I saw it on your Instagram, and it's yeah, it, it's awesome. It's right. Spot on. So then they kind of took a life onto their own, and everybody was like, "You guys are going to raise the price of the 914s," and we're like, "For for me personally, I just think they're a really interesting car that goes back to childhood." Mm-hmm. They're the predecessor to the mid-engine Boxster right. and the Cayman. Mm-hmm. And really, it's like you got the Cayman GT4 and a hot rod in 914. It's like you can see where they're going and yeah. what the relationship like is. Like the yellow one for from your Nürburgring uh, commercial. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so for me, the next step was doing the research going, okay, well, I don't want a tired 80 horsepower motor. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking mid-engine car, this could be a really fun track dedicated car versus the 911, which is now getting a little bit too expensive to risk replacement value and the cost of track insurance and all the rest. So I started doing my research and all roads through some heavy advice of Rod Emery at Emery Motors, because through my adventures of the car world and shooting this pilot with Magnus that we did and Rod Emery was on it, and I said to Rod, okay, if I'm going to get a 914, he's like, oh, you can get them for two grand. I'm like, I don't live in California, right? <laughs> this was during yeah. the shopping phase. Right. But it made me confident, like, oh, two, three grand, we'll do it. He's like, yeah, then you got to go to Fat Motors. They do our nine, our uh, 356 motor hot, like, mm-hmm. racing engines for our clients. These are the guys to talk to. And so I reach out to them in December, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we can fit you in, no problem. I'm like, great. Then I go on Facebook in January and like, we're retiring. I'm like, the sky's falling. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And your car was already there? No, I like, I was like, this was it. I was going to go to LA for a week. Right. Have a little like personal holiday mm-hmm. post everything that had happened over the last year. Mm-hmm. Hang out with Magnus because I hadn't seen him in a year and a half since his wife passed away, since my wife passed away. And it was just like, we were going to just hang out. And I was like, mm-hmm. and I'm going to take the 914 that had been sitting for a year and a half to fat and have them do their thing to the point in which it had gone to TRE just to get new spark plugs. Like the whole nine yards was done, right? Like we were like down this path. So I called them up and they're like, we officially go out of business on May 1st and the new owners that are coming in are no longer doing the restoration thing. They're just doing, they're a CNC VW company and they're really well known but they haven't told me the name okay and they're going to buy fat and they're only going to do the cnc and the tool and die and machine stuff and motors so you can still send your motor to get a kit motor but you can't roll your car in i was like yeah yeah but i want to do it And they're like well we've got someone he hasn't really like shit or get off the pot right i'm like i will be there tomorrow they're like what about the price i'm like we've talked about the price (laughs) price isn't changing from what we talked about a month ago i will be there tomorrow because yeah. in my mind, I'm like, I'm already ahead the price on the car. I know what they were quoting me. Ten grand later, I'm going to have a hot rod. Like, fuck it. Right. I'm in, right? Yeah, yeah. So we basically drove to Orange County. Now, I'd spent three days driving around L.A. We went up to Angelina Crest Highway. We I had some meetings in L.A. Driving around. And basically, it took about 25 seconds to get to 60. 
It could get to 90 miles an hour. <laughs> it had, no, no, no. It, it, could, it was flying in fifth at 90 miles an hour, no problem on the 405. Okay. It just had no brakes. Uh, and by no brakes, I mean you've got the travel on the brake pedal. And when you hit bottom, it should lock up. Or if you have an ABS car, trigger <laughs> ABS. It shouldn't be like an old bicycle whose drum brake, you're fully <laughs> down on it. And like, it's just you coasting. Yeah. to a stop so imagine that going from 90 and then some guy cuts in front of you oh, that God. was three days of driving around like that going okay synchro in seconds gone the motor is weak and tired but it's 42 years old yeah, fair enough right yeah. and the brakes don't work and the suspension shot so this is a project so we we rolled into fat and the guys were like okay we'll do it and so basically now I'm in a day-to-day -day dialogue with these guys and it's great because they're, they build race cars and they build dune buggies and they build track cars and they build canyon carvers. And so they're telling me, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to get struts from over here from a 911 SC. Don't worry. We found some. The second, we're just going to put it. I'm like, great, do it. So oh, basically wow. we're doing 911 front end, uh, 914 six back end so your parking brake still works suspension brakes new struts the whole nine yards transmission's been sent out to get all that fixed and they're doing a complete rebuild and so we thought we had a 1.8 when they pulled apart they're like hey great news your block's a two liter you've got the two liter right and so <laughs> basically when they're done it'll be 175 horsepower awesome uh you know the mark IV vw motor right so you've uh -huh. got the boxster engine 175 horsepower so the weight ratio hasn't changed mm -hmm. and the braking power of an sc 911 so it'll stop it with the same 1800 pound go-kart structure yeah. oh my god it's going to be such a crazy go-kart right and then like big you know 45 weber cams and the whole nine yards so that's pretty much going to be the track car. It's going to sound awesome too. Oh, it's going to like just the backfiring. So what's, your, uh, so what's your ETA in, ter in terms of like that project being full finished through done and back they, to you? They told me that they have to be done May 1st. So my hope. Oh, okay. Right. My hope. Well, because it's not like a 911 motor that's so much more complicated. These are VW engines and they like, they've ripped it apart. Transmission's happening. They've got a bigger team. It's, it's. You know, they're really pushing to get it done. And when I call them up and go, hey, you guys want to change all the weather seals on the window and the roof and this is coming to Canada? They're like, we're not getting into that. We're staying mechanical. Uh, so now I know i got to call Matt at Alchemy Paints and be like, dude, weather seal the whole thing. I'll give you 500 bucks mm -hmm. and I'll buy the weather seals and do it before it comes to Canada. Yeah, smart. Right? And yeah. so they're kind of project managing me to go, no, we're just doing mechanical stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that's fine because... I kind of want it to be a rat rod. I don't care that it's patina, that it's three different shades of yellow, that the seats are a little beat up, that the dashboard's cracked. Because I have the pristine car, and I love it. But this is the car that it's like, oh, bird shit on it. Fuck, who cares? Yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, right? that's the thing. is, I, There's so much joy, I find, in just being able to drive a car for what it is and not fucking worry about what ends up happening to it. Like, it's just, I, I mean, no, not where, anywhere near the caliber of what, you get, what you've got. But, I mean... With my WRX, I mean it's 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 been driven, and right. I think that's what I love about it. I get it in every day, and I'm not worried about a little rub here, or someone shits on it, a stone chip driving it on the highway. You're like, this is my car that I like to drive. That's I have a passion for driving, right? And now you've got the machine to really be able to pull behind that. Yeah, and I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, the 911 isn't a garage princess. Like I don't have a garage. It, you know, it just it drives, and it's meant to be driven. And stone chips are a prize. Mm -hmm. Right, if you got rubber stains and ch stone chips and all the rest, it means you've driven the car. Yeah, I've exactly. taken it out onto dirt roads and had it, you know, slideways as they say. <laughs> yeah, and like, yeah, right. That's part of it, right? Yeah. And you're sitting there doing it on R8 tires, and you're like, <laughs> "This is not safe, but it's fun as hell." Yeah, right. But you know, for me, it was like that. That night, driving, even though we had no brakes and no power, we were, you know, in the crest going downhill. That mid-engine driving experience is unbelievable. Like how responsive and light the front is and throwing it into a turn. And you can be a little lazy. You don't have to be like a 911 where you're like 
this is a science to what you're doing. And right. You want the sledgehammer to whip around. Right. And not <laughs> trail break here and break uh-huh. there. Uh-huh. This thing was just like, and turn. Right. And turn. And so I was like, oh, I get it. <laughs> you know? So that was kind of the story, like the, the car trajectory. And, mm-hmm. you know, then when I was in L.A., once I sent it to Fat, the guys at Sharkworks had left a GT4 with Magnus and so we took it out on a 400 mile run I saw the photos of it too and I was like wow the fuck so how did he get these so the guys at Fat the guys at Sharkworks Magnus Walker you did this like epic Porsche tour while you were there well, just... I, this is part of the B&B service of crashing at Magnus's loft fair enough right this uh. is just a day in his life and so <laughs> even the safari car that was at oh yeah yeah like What's that it? was there was a photo shoot for WK suspension that Magnus was in and they showed up and all of a sudden my car was in the photo shoot I'm like I don't know how many suspension. What is it? It's the I, the Lufta Luft- Lufting Cool three Luft-Cool. auction car that yeah. was a charity car and that super w- special car. Yeah, I mean a great car. I mean <laughs> I I gotta say having not dri- I drove in it in the downtown streets with Magnus and we were both kind of like it's just a jacked up SC. But to be right. fair to it, we both kind of said, well it's got skinny tires, it's jacked up. The ride height's all different than we're used to. Mm-hmm. I wonder what it's like in the dirt. Right, yeah, yeah. Because exactly. that was what it was made for. So uh-huh. having never driven it... That's the big thing. Right? Yeah. Like, I have no idea. But I have a friend, Jim, who's got this crazy rally car in Savannah, Georgia. And he's always driving through the mud and the dirt and all that. And I'm like, well, that looks like fun. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, you know, we didn't get to use it. But it was definitely like... A tor- Porsche tour, yeah, and we had that GT4, and we were dry. We basically went up to Idlewild into the mountains, down into Palm Desert, over to Joshua Tree, behind Big Bear, up into the crest, and then back down into LA. And I, it was the first time I really understood the water cooled addiction of like extra horsepower, extra suspension, <laughs> gear ratios, and part of me went. Well, those guys in the GT3 are cheating on the track, <laughs> right? Like when I'm doing yeah, totally. 200 at the top totally. of yeah. the, the hill at going into turn eight, oh my, God, and yeah. I'm like puckered and it's 200 kilometers an hour and you're like, the whole thing's lifting and dancing and these guys are just... Wah, wah, gone. And you're like, okay, it's a completely different driving experience. Yeah. For them, they have to get to 260 to have that same sensation. Because mm-hmm. I actually pushed the GT... Four, we won't say numbers on air. Right, right. But we pushed it on, in some desert roads to see, and like at second, all the way at red line, only then, and so you figure out what that math yeah. was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I only then was I getting the same visceral driving experience that I had at 90 miles an hour in the 914 with no brakes, no suspension, and a tired motor. And so what I realized is for me getting to that that line where you're riding the edge earlier meets my like we're not in the Autobahn so yeah yeah it's there's something about driving a slow car fast that's more fun the whole idea of momentum right. cars the slow car fast finding finding some finding a threshold in a car that you feel comfortable with. Like I learned that in, I mean, I I was, you know, I built a couple of cars up when I was younger and when I was in college. And I mean, I did that where I found for the first time ever, that kind of threshold in like an EG Civic. And it was just, it was, I'd built it up. I'd lightened it. I'd just done some subtle things to it that got me to a point where in a driving program, I was in a safe environment, be able to actually like push it and push it and push it. And front wheel drive, it's a lot easier to be able to feel that as even if you find a lot of it. Um, and it, to me, made it so much more fun where I was like, I don't need a 300 horsepower car to be able to blast around a track all the time. Because this as a driving experience to me was what it was all about. And I think that's when you find it and you find a lot of the purists that have come to that understand that you don't need i mean i'm all for an 800 horsepower car that's great and i love that people are doing that and pushing the limits but you know 300 horsepower 400 horsepower that's a lot of power when you start calculating power to weight for sure and i will say this that the guys at Sharkworks had done something to the gear ratio they left first and second but they did a basically a short shift gear ratio okay between third fourth fifth mm-hmm 
So normally when you shift, you have that drop in power of about 800 RPM, right? Yeah. right? If you're doing proper shifts. Mm -hmm. Theirs was five or 300. Like you were always in the power band. Oh, so man. dropping from 54th just to and blast, I felt like I was having this crazy outer body experience <laughs> where I was looking down on myself and it was an episode of like 1970s Cannonball Run where on the highway, look at someone downshift gone <laughs> gone and you're at like 200 kilometers an hour effortlessly and you're like this is amazing yeah right I, so you know i've only ever experienced anything like that i'd say the closest for me was in a nissan gtr and you know i was lucky right. enough to get behind the wheel of one of the first ones that came to canada and uh it was it was one of those experiences where i, I actually i couldn't believe it and of course like with the paddles um i mean it was a it was that visceral experience, but when you know you dropped a gear on the highway, you were gone, and your guts felt like they're going to get pushed through the back of the seat. It was fucking crazy. Yeah, I mean, I think that the like you could see where the addictive kind of notion to that power comes from. <laughs> yeah. Like these guys are taking that Sharkworks car and they're going to turn it into a four point two for a three point eight. <laughs> it already has four hundred and seventy something horsepower. Right, it's going to yeah, be like yeah. what seven hundred when they're done with it. And I get it. I get what they're doing. And they're smart about keeping first and second functional. Drivable, yeah. Right? But I also sit there and go, yeah, I mean, if I had an arsenal of cars and that was part of it. Like, I never expected to have the 914. Why not? I was happy with one. Now, two, I've become a car collector. <laughs> That's fine. It's, I can, I can accept those terms. But, you know, a, a brand new, modern, water-cooled Porsche or... I mean, look at this Lambo that just broke all the records today at the Nürburgring, right? Oh, I didn't even know. Yeah, the the, the lightweight RS kind of Lambo, I can't remember what it is. It just broke the 918's time. No way. Crushed it. Oh, Jesus. Right? So they're just getting faster and faster yeah. and faster. Yeah. It's like, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. And now I've experienced it. And I mean, I was shooting these cars for commercials, and we were in the Russian armed pursuit, but we were traveling at a speed that the camera was creating energy. And yeah, we were moving at enough speed that the car could let out, but a good driver could do that at a slower speed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I never sat in the car, either as driver or passenger, at 10 tens, let alone mm -hmm. at eight tens or whatever. And so it was, it was a great experience to experience it. Would I sell everything and go get a brand new one? No, I, there's something about the mechanical experience of that driving that you know there's no stereo there's no heat there's no nothing like it's just yeah. pure driving experience that i prefer and it doesn't mean that the other people's stuff isn't great it's just it was kind of weird being in this car and flipping through stuff on the ipad i was like yeah you know or i iphone or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. right like picking yeah. tracks it was like yeah. it was kind of weirdly foreign like why am i even having the option to listen to music. Yeah, it's like I should be paying attention to driving. It was like right. it was like when, yeah. you know, all German cars didn't didn't come with cup holders because they were like, why would you be drinking something while you're you don't need driving? It. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And so, you know, to circle back then to all of this, I mean, for me, to your original question, how did I get into cars, I guess it was always around me. And then I developed an interest and then said, I wanted to take that interest to the track and have that experience. Mm -hmm. And that simultaneously as I was, you know, moving forward in my career directing, I was paralleling these experiences and kind of figuring if I'm going to film a car going into the turn and coming out of the apex, I got to know what that's about to experience it, to film it. And so... I was living this kind of dual life of working as an agency producer, producing big stuff for Honda and Acura and all the rest, and all the while pursuing a directing career. But I had a mortgage to pay and a standard of living of which my wife and kids had grown accustomed to. <laughs> so I was juggling it till I kind of hit a critical mass in which I said, okay, I'm walking away from the producing side and just pursuing the directing side. And I was fortunate enough that that was a really smooth transition. There was a part of that critical mass was kind of that fork in the road was Urban Outlaw in many ways. Because what happened was I'd spent so much time working with really talented directors and producing their stuff or shooting my own stuff 
in the car world that I kind of felt that there was very little of it that was capturing the visceral driving experience for me as a car lover. And so I couldn't agree more. And it really shows in your work. Yeah. Right. So for me, it was like, okay, well, I got to kind of put my money where my mouth is. And if step up to the plate and say, well, it can be done. And so the, the, the way urban outlaw happened was essentially, I was in that kind of flux between balancing working as a producer and working as a director and in that world. And there was a couple of jobs I was up on and they were going my way. And for whatever reason in this industry, whether it's new marketing director comes in and it cancels it or, you know, funding is lost or they're having a bad quarter. What are, you know, there's so many things that yeah. can happen that are out of your control. I turned down some other work, both on the producing side and directing side for this one project. And then it went away. And it said so that, that kind of, applied arts, creative, uh, emotional life cycle of a gnat where it's like you're on a high and then you're on a low kind of spiked. And then a good friend of mine, I know you know him, Paul Pru, yeah, who's an editor, was cutting a piece for me and he was calling me up going, dude, you got to come down to the edit suite and check out this piece. And I'm like, ah, fuck it. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, ah, just my head's not into it. And he's like, dude, it's amazing. Come down. I'm like, not today. And then I opened an iPad that was sitting on my desk and it was kind of like when iPads were really fresh and everybody was getting magazines on them. Right. Yeah. And it opened to a magazine which was Total 9-11 and there was an article on Magnus Walker in the magazine and it was just kind of like a photo essay with a couple of lines of dialogue but enough information there that you got a sense of it. And I looked at it and I was like, that's the alchemy I'm going to make a film about this guy. And it's just, that was the thought. And then I went online, I did some research. And so that concludes part one of the Tamir Moscovich episode. So stay tuned for part two. I'm just currently doing a little bit of editing. It'll be up probably within a week. And we get a bit deeper into Urban Outlaw and Kaz and some of Tamir's kind of philosophies to making films. Um, really interesting show coming up. So please do tune in uh, to part two of the Tamir Moscovich episode of the Bucket Seat Podcast. Thanks, and we'll talk to you soon again. <laughs>